Welcome to Passionate World Talk Radio. Educate, enlighten, entertain. Hello, everyone. I had to do the disclaimer. Any information discussed in this interview may not be the views of the station or the host. Please discuss any information with your primary care physician. This is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy and Passionate World Talk Radio, where our mantra is to educate, enlighten, and entertain. Folks, you're going to want to listen to my guest today, very interesting guest. My guest today is Rabbi Rami Shapiro, who has a PhD. He is the award-winning author of over 36 books on religion, spirituality, and recovery. Rabbi Rami co-directs the One River Foundation, is a contributing editor with Spirituality and Health Magazine, hosts two podcasts, Essential Conversations with Rabbi Rami and Conversations on the Edge, and a weekly Zoom talk show called Roadside Assistance at the Corner of, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce the Hebrew right, I'll just say Wild and Chaos. I think it's, uh, how would you pronounce that, Rabbi? Tahu Vahu? Yeah. Exactly, Tahu Vavohu. Oh, oh, okay. Of, <laughs> of the wild and chaotic. Oh, that sounds awesome. He received the Houston Smith Award for Excellence in, in Interspiritual Education in 2020. And the name of the book that we're going to talk about today is Judaism Without Tribalism, A Guide to Being a Blessing to All the Peoples of the Earth. By Rabbi Rami Shapiro. I'm going to welcome you, Rabbi, to Chatting with Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. It is an honor to talk with you. Oh, thank you. It's an honor to talk to you. You are my first rabbi. I did interview an ex-nun, and I have interviewed a pastor. So I am thrilled to be interviewing a rabbi. And I'm going to ask you, Rabbi Shapiro, what I ask all the authors is, what inspired you to write your book, Judaism Without Tribalism? Well, you know, like you said, this is my 36th or 37th book. Uh, so the inspiration, it's not like, oh, this is this, this thing I have to do. I, my, my career is built on challenging ideas about religion, whether it's my own, you know, Judaism or in my work in perennial wisdom, the religions of, I mean, the world's religions, challenging the basic patriarchal core of these religions, the tribalist core of these religions. So this is another uh, attempt to do that. And I'm, and I'm always trying to simplify the way I do it so it, it has impact on more and more people. So it's just another attempt to try to get people to think twice about, uh, in this case, Judaism. I have to ask you this, uh, Rabbi Rami, because you're the first rabbi that I know who you are into, um, is it a Buddha, um, a different um, I, I'm philosophy? I'm interested in all religions. Yeah, I, I find them all infinitely fascinating. And I'm, I'm interested in the mystic side of various traditions. Because I think when you talk to the mystics or you read the mystics, you discover that they're all saying the same thing. I mean, that's one of the differences uh, about a religion that's trapped in tribalism and a religion that isn't. Um, tribalist religions are all about what makes them different from other religions, what makes them better. You know, when you say that the Jews are the chosen people and that implies that other people are not chosen, that's a tribalist statement. When you say that Christians are saved and everyone else is damned, that's a tribal statement. Or Muslims are true believers and everyone else is an infidel, that's a tribal statement. Mystics don't say any of that. Mystics know that everything is a manifestation of, and then you can fill in the blank, God, Allah, Brahman, you know, uh, whatever name fits your, whatever name suits you. The idea is that everything is that, or as in Sanskrit, tatsam asi, you know, you are that, you are the divine. Mystics know that. Um, when Jesus says, uh, I and the Father are one, that's the same idea. Christians claim, many, 
not all, but many claim that only Jesus can say that. Mystics say no, everybody can say that. And they'll say it in their own language. So that's why I'm, that's what attracts me in the world's religions, is the mystical message that they all share. That's very interesting. I was wondering actually what you uh, meant by uh, Judaism without tribalism, um, of what you considered, what was tribalism now that you said about, you know, being the, um, you know, chosen people, never thought about that as a tribal, uh, you know, statement, or even, I never even thought about tribalism, actually, until, you know, looking at your book. And I was, um, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, there's a, a difference between tribe and tribalism. So mm-hmm. I have no problem with belonging to a tribe. I mean, Judaism is a tribe. Lots of Native American traditions are tribal-based. The difference is when the tribe becomes, the, the, sort of you make an idol out of the tribe, and that's tribalism. Um, it's when, you know, I, I'm very happy being a Jew. I love, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be a Jew and being part of the Jewish tribe. But when someone says, well, if you're not a Jew, you're less than, that's a tribalistic statement, not a tribal statement. Or when you, you, you know, want to excommunicate someone for marrying someone from a different tribe. I mean, that's tribalism. But tribes themselves, that's part of human nature probably. I mean, besides religious tribes, we have, I mean, I also belong to the tribe of Apple. <laughs> you know, I don't <laughs> have a PC anywhere in sight and all, all of my, my uh, technology is, is from the same company, and I have this tribal loyalty to, to Apple. But I wouldn't say that my grandson can't date or marry uh, a person who, you know, has a PC or, or talks on a Samsung phone rather than an iPhone. You know, that's, that would be, you know, it sounds absurd when you're talking about it from the point of view of, of capitalist marketing. But it's the same thing when you're talking about it from the point of view of religion. So tribe is fine with me. Tribalism is not. I think that's interesting. I, I have to ask you this because I married someone. I'm Jewish. I was brought up Jewish. I didn't get uh, bas mitzvahed, but um, you know, I was raised in a very reformed Jewish home, and I intermarried. Uh, my husband was not Jewish, although he loved the Jewish people. And what is your opinion on that? of intermarrying, do you think that is hurting the Jewish population? No. No, I think it's inevitable. If you live in an open and free society and you don't live in a ghetto, uh, and you can, I mean, there are Jewish ghettos that you can freely you know, move to and live in and never you know, meet someone who isn't Jewish. But no, I have no problem with, with intermarriage. I think the threat to the future of Judaism Uh, whether we're talking about in Israel or in the diaspora, I think the threat is the the lack of meaning, the the fact that most people, or I shouldn't say most, but many, many people look at Judaism and go, what the hell is this all about? What's it for? What's the purpose? You know, what, what is it? How does it add value to my life? And there are certain obvious ways, community, that kind of thing. But I think lots of people are looking for a deeper spiritual value and they don't find it in Judaism. But they also don't find it in a lot of mainstream religions because they're looking for something that is deeper, broader than the notion of an anthropomorphic male deity who lives outside the universe, who runs, who created it, who runs it, who judges everybody according to certain Behavior, behavioral standards that he, it's always that he sets up. Um, lots and lots of people are just outgrown that notion and they're at a loss. Now, now Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, I mean, they all, on, on the surface level, they all talk that way. But when you get again to the mystic level, to the deep uh, existential core of these these. Uh, traditions as spiritualities, you find 
the same deep message that I think people are yearning for. I call it in two of my books on this topic, uh, perennial wisdom. Perennial because it always comes around. It never seems to go away. And, and wisdom, just because it's, it's just another way of saying that this is, this is a, true, uh, a true insight. But perennial wisdom, as I define it, has four points, real simple. The first point is, we already said it, that everything is a manifesting of God, whether you call God um, Christ or the Trinity or Allah or Adonai or Brahman or nature, mother, you know, whatever it happens to be, the language is unique to each culture. But everything, you and I, the technology we use to communicate, the world, of the natural world around us, everything in the universe, is a manifesting of this single non-dual reality, just the way every wave is a manifesting of the ocean that waves it. So that's the first point. We're all expressions of the divine. The second point is human beings can know this directly. You know, there's so many contemplative practices in every religious tradition that's designed not to make you a better Jew, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, but are designed to awaken you to the fact of your own divinity and the divinity of everything else. The third thing is that when you awaken to that divinity, you are naturally drawn to what the Bible calls in Genesis 12, 3, you're naturally drawn to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, to live according to the golden rule. And the fourth point is that awakening to this divine reality and living uh, in accord with the golden rule to be a blessing, this is your highest calling as a human being. Every religion has that at its mystic heart. Um, and I think that's what people are, are looking for. And you, and you don't have to leave your religion to find it. So lots of people are, once you realize it's in every tradition, you want to know how it's expressed in different traditions, and that will broaden your, your spiritual foundation. That's, um, that's beautiful. It's very interesting because I, I always end my show with saying, you know, in a world where you could be anything to please be kind, but um, my show, uh, Channing with Betsy, is about uh, helping others. And so uh, I hope to be a blessing to other people. I mean, that's what I, you know, always wanted to be and uh, to know what my gifts are. And... Um, I finally found him in my 60s, Rabbi. <laughs> Took me till my till I was over 60 to find out um, my gifts and my my purpose. But I always say, better late than never. I have to, um, absolutely. You know, uh, ask you this: When I was growing up, and you know, my dad was from the World War II um, era, and so when. I intermarried, and I wasn't the first one in my family intermarried. I had another cousin who intermarried a few before me. It was such a shame back then. You know, my father was like, oh, this is what's going to kill, you know, Judaism. It's, um, I even had a rabbi tell me, you know, this is how Judaism is going to die and, uh, because people are intermarrying and then they're not being raised Jewish. And I'm glad to hear that you have a different view on that. You know, you could still yeah. be Jewish and you could still practice your Judaism and be intermarried to somebody else. Yeah, um, I think that's true. But I, I think you have to give your dad some slack, <coughs> you know, coming out mm-hmm. of the whole Holocaust uh, right. generation that, that I, I'm sure that's got to be in there. I mean, because my dad's the same. You know, we're, I'm, old, I'm older than you by a, a decade. But... Um, my father, too, is in the same boat. And, you know, he was, he was worried that, you know, what Hitler didn't accomplish, wiping out all the Jews, you know, Jews would accomplish by disappearing on their own. But it, it didn't happen. It's, it's not, you know, I don't think that's the issue. And a lot of people who intermarry bring their spouse into the Jewish fold in one way or the other and raise their kids uh, as Jews, again, in one way or the other. It's not... There's so many choices now. There's so many different. My, my son has he has an interest in synagogue. Um, he's got a little kid, and, and if there were a synagogue where he lives, um, 
I think he would, he would explore it because there isn't one. But he's a professor of Jewish, American Jewish literature. And if he had to choose between the religion and the literature of the Jewish people, I mean, he'd choose the literature. He thinks it's more powerful. And the Bible's included in that, but so is Philip Roth. So, you know, it's the whole, it's the whole gamut. So he found his own way to be Jewish. And it isn't mine. And it certainly uh, isn't what, what his, uh, you know, what my father would, would consider, well, that's not really Jewish, that's his professor. So it's very different. It's just much broader, a lot more choices. And the more, I think that, that Judaism is quite vibrant, um, especially, not especially, quite vibrant among those who have intermarried and doing, you know, working on the, the edges where you can be more creative, maybe. Yes. Um, yes, I agree. My husband, like I said, uh, his name is uh, uh, Matthew. Uh, he loved really the, the Jewish people, Jewish culture. And we used to watch uh, Jewish Life TV. Um, and he, he loved watching that. They had great shows on there. And, uh, well, my husband had early onset Alzheimer's, Rabbi, so I would tease Matt because uh, I, would say, I would, gave him the Hebrew name of Moshe since his name is Matthew, and um, he believed that he, he was Jewish, um, and I said, you know what, that, that's cool. But I, I just think that if people, some people, Rabbi, no matter what faith you're in, are very narrow-minded. Um, sure. And accepting, you know, other people's um, beliefs. Uh, I think it's. I mean, I'm curious. Was your father um, alive when you took up other, knowing other religions and being interested in other religions? How did he feel about that? He must have. He was like yeah, my I, father when I had a fit. <laughs> yeah, no, he he was not happy. I mean, I started my study of Buddhism uh, in high school, so, so my dad was not was not all that happy. Um, and then, I mean, I, I majored in, in Buddhist studies as an undergrad and studied with a Zen master for quite a while. And then when I decided to become a rabbi, uh, we were Orthodox, and I told him I wasn't going to the Orthodox seminaries. I was going to go to the Reform Seminary. He was very unhappy about that as well. But, you know, that's generational difference and you know in the end I think he, I mean I, I don't think I know in the end he came around he visited my congregation a, a few times he joined a congregational trip to Israel which was a, an amazing experience for both of us he and I um, for you know two weeks in, in Israel so he understood it wasn't it was never going to be his Judaism um, it was way too liberal, but he understood the appeal to other people who he, he found to be worthy, you know, good people. So, you know, he, he came around, but he was not happy in the beginning. Yes, I can imagine. Now, were you brought up in a uh, Orthodox home? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. So, yes, I could see where your dad would have been very upset since you were brought up Orthodox. I mean, I was brought up very, very reform. Um, but yeah, my parents were still uh, upset, as were my um, mother's parents. Not so much my father's parents, but uh, my mother's parents were uh, very upset. And yeah. um, I mean, you can understand you know, that. I mean, they really thought yes. this was the end of the line. That that boy, you're you're responsible as as a potential mom for bringing on another generation of Jews, and now you're marrying out, so that line is, is done. Um, but it's not true necessarily, I and mean, I don't know what your, your personal story is, but it's not true, so you know, it's just not true. I have to ask you your philosophy on, or your, your thoughts on this, Rabbi, because I've heard conflicting. So I'll ask you what you think. I heard, I was brought up, that um, if the mother is Jewish, then the child is Jewish. But then I heard recently that the father 
uh, is Jewish, then the child is Jewish. So what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think both of them are ridiculous. But the, the tradition is <laughs> that if your, your mother is Jewish, then, yeah, you're Jewish. It's, it's, you know, it's considered a, um, it's, it's in the blood somehow. And then uh, in the, I don't know if it's the 70s or 80s, but in, in liberal Judaism, like um, Reform and Reconstructionist, they said, well, if it's, you know, if it's the mother, the, the kid has, you know, the genes come from both. So if it's a genetic transfer, then, you know, then the father too is a legitimate um, you know, ancestor to claim your, your, through which to claim your Judaism. I, I think the whole thing is silly. Um, you know, if, like I write in the book, just because your mother might be a ballerina doesn't mean you, you have to be, a, you're going to, you are a ballerina. <laughs> No, I mean, you know, right. you might be interested in ballet. She might teach you about ballet, take you to ballet, and you might decide to become a ballerina. But you're not, you're not a ballerina because your mother or your father, for that matter, is a ballerina. My, my own sense is, and this is very radical, I mean, no, no, no Jewish institution accepts my definition, but my, my definition of a Jew is someone who calls themselves a Jew. You know, I mean, if your mother's Jewish and you call yourself Catholic, then the idea that you're really Jewish is absurd to me. Um, but if your mother is Catholic and you call yourself a Jew, well, okay, I take you at your word. You're a Jew. Now, are you a serious Jew, an educated Jew, a knowledgeable Jew? Well, that's, you know, that's another story. I would like to see people who call themselves Jews to be educated in, you know, in, in uh what Judaism has to say in, you know, in all of its diversity. But to think that, I, I personally just don't, I don't care what your mom or your dad was. I care what you say you are and what you do with what you say. Uh, well, thank you. I, I want to hear your opinion. I, I have to ask you this uh, question. I love the cover of your book, and it has the tree of life. Um, could you explain that meaning? Because I have seen it, uh, the tree of, of life, um, you know, symbols and, and pictures, and I really wanted to know what the, the meaning is behind that. Well, that's a difficult question because, I mean, usually when people talk about at Chaim of the tree of life, a lot of times they're, what they have in mind is the Kabbalistic tree of life with the 10 spherota, the 10 circles. And that's um, like the chakras in, in Hinduism, that the divine manifests through these 10 channels. And, and we won't go into them because it gets very esoteric. But that's, you know, that's how you understand that. The tree of life in the Bible, um, the Bible only tells you what exists. It doesn't really tell you much about it. Um, you know, it's part of the early myth of, of uh, Adam and Eve, but the tree that on the cover of my book, I have no idea what the author, what the artist had in mind when she came up with that. So I really <laughs> well, it's can't pretty. It on. It's a pretty cover, uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I like it. I mean, to me, it looks like... Um, uh, to, I mean, my interpretation, and I am very nearsighted, but I have my glasses off, it's very pretty. Uh, to me, it looks like hearts. It could represent there's leaves, but to me, I see hearts. And um, so I'm getting, you know, like, the tree of life, it branches out and, you know, to love um, others and to spread love, you know, to and happiness. Yeah, all, all that all that works for me. And, and if we're gonna, you know, play with the symbol, you know, the tree grows out of these out of its root system, and the root system is on the earth, and the earth requires the rest of the universe. So the the tree is a manifesting of the universe, and all of that to me yes. is a manifesting of, of God. And and everything's interconnected in the tree. So uh, and that's, that's yeah. something that the mystics teach us that every one, every being, is interconnected with every other being. Um, yes. So, yeah. yeah. If, you get, if you get that, if you get that from the cover, great. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, I'm into book covers. I know that sounds kind of strange. Uh, I have to ask you uh, this question uh, because um, it, it, it's on the, the list, but I really want to know it for myself anyway. What is the grave, gravest danger facing Jews today? I think the biggest danger is a sense of meaninglessness, that you look at Judaism and you go, why do I want to bother with this? I mean, anti-Semitism is on the rise, but I don't think that's a threat in the sense of, um, you know, the far right um, people who, who you know, promote anti-Semitism in this country or in Europe or the far left where uh, their criticism of Israel becomes a criticism of Jews, which makes them anti-Semitic. They're, they're a problem that we have to wrestle with always but I don't think they're a threat to our survival. I think threat to our survival is just Jews walking away from Judaism because they find Judaism meaningless. When, when I was a kid in high school, back in the 60s, I was looking for spiritual, I mean, a spiritual experience of something greater than myself. And I went to synagogue. I, mean, we I went to synagogue and I didn't find it there. You know, I mean, there was tradition and there was family and there was music that I, had, I knew by heart. And, and there was a sense of belonging. But the things that people believed there, I didn't believe. And the experience I was looking for, I didn't find. So I went in search of alternatives. And I don't know. I, I, I don't know why Buddhism came up first, but it did. And when I started meditating, I said, oh, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a way to get in touch with this greater reality of which I am a part and not just talk to it in a, you know, through a prayer book, not just praise it as if it were separate from me, to experience it as something that includes me. And that's what Buddhism offered. So does Hinduism. But what I didn't know is so does the mystical dimension of Judaism. But Growing up the way I grew up, my rabbis never mentioned mysticism. I don't even know if they were aware of, well, they had to be. They were, they were orthodox trained. They must be aware that there is such a thing as Jewish mysticism, but they never talked about it. My parents would have just said, what is that? And, and just, you know, screwed up their faces like that. It's not Judaism. What are they talking about? So had someone shown me that when I was a kid, I probably would have stayed. But they didn't. So I went to Buddhism and then I went to Hinduism. And it took me a while to find that what I thought was a uniquely Asian, you know, in, uh, Chinese, Indian, Tibetan, Japanese phenomenon, Korean phenomenon, was also in Judaism because this perennial wisdom is everywhere. It's, and, and, the methodolo and, the method and the methodologies for tapping into it are similar, but they're tailored to each culture. So when I did Buddhism, I had to learn to chant in languages I didn't really understand. And the same thing in Hinduism. And, uh, but when I found it in Judaism, I said, oh, wait, I understand what I'm doing here. I can, I can read this material. I, can, I know this material. So anyway, maybe that's a little long answer. But it's, it's the lack oh, that's okay. of, of that experience. It's the lack of a real spiritual experience the lack of meaning, uh, I think, that really threatens the future of Judaism. And I think that's true both in, uh, in, in the diaspora and in Israel. Um, I, I know a lot of Israelis uh, go to India in search of some, some meaning. When I lived in Israel, it was a long time ago, but when I lived in Israel for a year or so, uh, I found a Zen master in Jerusalem. And he had a lot of Israeli, you know, students who were you know, Jews, and I, I would ask them, why did they come? I mean, this is, the country is so religious. And said, yeah, but it's, it's just the form. It doesn't have the heart. And here you can meditate and experience the, the heart. You would talk about the heart of the divine, but still, uh, to experience something on that, that deeper level. And I, I think that's still the case, that while it's changing, and there are a lot of places to study Jewish contemplative practice and to learn about Jewish mystical teachings, 
Um, still, it's not something that the mainstream offers. And, and I think that's a threat. Bar and bat mitzvah kids aren't taught this, this wonderful aspect of their tradition. And then when they go looking for something, they don't look in Judaism because they don't know it's there. When you talk about mystic Judaism, are you referring to the Kabbalah? Kabbalah, Kabbalah is, is one form of Jewish mysticism. Hasidism is another, uh, but there are lots of different forms of Jewish mystical understanding. Jewish Kabbalah technically starts in the early Middle Ages, but Jewish mysticism probably goes back to the Bible, so thousands of years earlier. So I, what I mean when I talk about mysticism in general is a direct encounter with that greater reality that you might call God, but a direct encounter, not an encounter mediated by a book or a rabbi or a priest or anyone a direct encounter, and, and, and with that encounter, an awakening to the divine in, with, and as you and everything else. So that, that's when, I'm, when I say Jewish mystics, I'm talking about Jews who uh, are in touch with that divine reality and, can, and some of whom will then share the methodology for experiencing it yourself. Wow, that's, that sounds very... I mean, it's very interesting to me um, what you're saying, and you are just, um, I, I find you just very interesting, uh, Rabbi. Uh, can you tell the audience where they can listen to your podcast? Because I think more people should know about you and, and listen to what you have to say. Sure. I think more people should listen to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I, even though even though you said I had two podcasts, we're, I'm actually just down to one podcast. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm one, okay. Simplifying, si- simplifying things with when COVID started. Uh, but I work for Spirituality and Health magazine, and you can go to spiritualityhealth.com, and you, know, you can subscribe to the magazine if you like. You can read my essays in the on the uh, print in print, or you can read them in uh, the digital format. And then the podcast is called uh, Spirituality and Health Podcast. And you can subscribe, you know, for free through iTunes or Apple, uh, any, any of the, the podcast apps. And the show is twice a month, and I interview people who are featured in the magazine. So it's not a Jewish show. It's a show about spirituality and health. Right, right. Yes, I saw that uh, you interview all, you know, different um, people from all uh, walks of life. So you have just one podcast. Oh, okay. And I highly recommend to people, you know, to go and check uh, the rabbi's podcast because um, it's just very interesting and to check out your your book. Judaism Without Tribalism, which is available on Amazon.com. And you can get it through you can Amazon. Support. You can go to your local bookstore and help support your independent bookstore. If they don't have it on the shelf, they can always order it. But, yeah, you can certainly get it on Amazon. Uh, and it's coming out. I, heard, I mean, it's out this week. And then I heard that the publisher's coming out with an audio uh, book version. But I have nothing to do with that one. Someone will be reading the book into a machine i well i think you're very interesting rabbi i mean you are the first rabbi that i know that has uh i want to say ventured into other um, beliefs and um i think that i you know i wish you were in new jersey and near me because i would just love to go to see one of your services but you're down in, well, are you down in Florida? Tennessee. No, Tennessee. Oh, Tennessee? Yeah. Oh, what did I think you were in Florida? Um, I was in Florida but I, for a long time. That's why. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, and I would just uh, would love to um, just see one of your, and hear one of your services because I think it would be a phenomenal. Um, Rabbi Ram. Rami, uh, do you have anything else to say to the audience before I wrap up? Any words of wisdom you would like to impart? 
you know, the only thing I would like to say is I think that as a species, we humans are going through a very difficult time. And, you know, there's, there's the pandemic and there's war in Europe and elsewhere around the globe. And there's I mean, the, the recent Supreme Court decisions on guns and on uh, you know, women's reproductive rights. I mean, there's a lot of it. We're going through a dark night of the soul in Christian terms or what the Hindus might call the Kali Yuga. And the only way we come through this with any sense of humanity intact is if we practice, that's really what you were saying um, at the top of the show, kindness. That, that is going to be crucial. If your religion doesn't open your heart and doesn't open your hand uh, to help and doesn't open, your, you know, doesn't open your heart to the suffering of the world, human suffering and others, doesn't open your hand to reach out and help beings, human and others, and it doesn't open your mind to the wisdom of uh, the spiritual traditions that humanity has been blessed with, then your religion is really the problem and not the solution. Um, so my, my hope is, and I'll leave a last word, is that you, you reach out, you, you seek out direct experience of the divine in, with, and as everything. Either you do it in your own tradition or you know, another tradition that speaks to you. That's the only way humanity survives the mess that we are we've created for ourselves. That is beautiful. I always say, Rabbi, that, you know, people think, oh, we're so different from each other, and we're not. We are more alike than we are different. And, you know, cut us all open, and we all bleed red blood. We need to unite in brotherhood and sisterhood and show love and kindness. I heard a saying one time that um, I don't even know where I, I saw it. It might have been on Facebook. I don't even remember. That if your religion teaches you to hate, then maybe it's time to look for another religion. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, because I think all, and I say the word religion loosely, but I think most of your tenets, your major tenets of all religions is to love one another, show brotherhood, and to, um, well, you know, as they say, do mitzvahs, you know, um, good deeds to, for your brother and sister, your neighbor. And, um, you know, it would be a much better I mean, world. I mean, Judaism, the Hebrew Bible says, love your neighbor, and then it says, love the stranger, and then Jesus as love your enemy. So that sort of covers everybody. Um, yes. Especially when you realize your neighbor isn't just your human neighbor, but you know, the entire biosphere in which we, in which we live and on which we are completely dependent. Yes. Um, I so enjoyed having you on, Rabbi Ami Shapiro. Thank you so much for coming on, chatting with Betsy. I Thank really you. enjoy talking to you. <coughs> Thank me. you, Betsy. You're welcome. Glad to be here. I, Oh, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Folks, the name of the book is Judaism Without Tribalism. And I highly recommend you to read it. And at the bottom, it says, A Guide to Being a Blessing to All the Peoples of the Earth. I love that. You know what? We do need to be a blessing to each other, don't we? And this has been a mission of mine. And I want to thank everyone for listening. And please share this podcast to help other people. Because when you share it, you are helping other people because I like to provide resources to help people and to let people know you're not alone. I'm here for you. I have resources for you, Uh, great people that come on that offer a tremendous amount of information on all different topics. And that's my mission and my vision is to help others. So when you share the show. You are helping me with my vision and my mission, and I so appreciate it. And you can hear this podcast again, wherever you hear your favorite podcast, um, on Speaker, Spotify, uh, Apple, to name just a few. It is free to subscribe, so I highly recommend that. And there will be information in the blog to read about Rabbi Rami Shapiro. And I want to thank Jeannie White, who's station manager, who writes the blog, produces the show, and I want to thank Lillian Caldwell, CEO of Passion World Talk Radio, who makes this all possible. 
And folks, as I always say, in the world of you could be anything, to so please be kind. You know what? Be a blessing to someone. If, you know, I just have to say this my own personal experience. When you help someone else, you are helping yourself because I know when I help someone else and I do this show, which gives me great joy, it helps me. It's my way of paying it forward. And um, as of, um, sure, a lot of you know that my husband died and I promised Matt that I would carry on with my vision and my mission, and I am doing so. So once again, when you share, you are helping me and you're helping my vision and my mission come true and carrying on that legacy. So I thank you all for listening and sharing, and I appreciate it. So, folks, this is Betsy Wurzel, your host of Chatting with Betsy on Pesha World Talk Radio. Until we chat again, be a blessing to other people and be kind. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Are you looking for an Internet talk radio station for your podcast? Look no further. At the helm of Passionate World Talk Radio are two women that want to provide a spot for you and your podcast to be heard. There are many other places for your podcast, but PWTR has the audience. You will not be disappointed. Our station has been on the Internet for the past 16 years. Call us for more information, 484 484- 364-1032 or text Jeannie White, station manager at T-H-E-C-O-N-N-E-C-T-S-H-O-W at gmail.com for a podcast show details. Thank you for listening to Passionate World Talk Radio. You can listen to this program all over again by going over to https colon forward slash forward slash passionate world talk radio dot com. You can also hear it on Spotify, Spreaker, Amazon A L E X A, AM FM two four seven dot com every Tuesday evening between eight and nine PM. YouTube Facebook, Facebook Live, LinkedIn, and all the other podcast directories one can find on the Internet.